Um, hi, everybody. Can you hear that? Spring is in the air. And it's time to think about your garden beds. Talk to your garden beds. And more importantly, listen to them. So these went to bed last winter and we put a blanket on them, which is leaves. And you do not want to disrupt things yet. It's too early, it's too cold. Um, you don't want to start tilling your soil yet. And there's a lot of important things that are in here. You can see, I don't know, can you see that? You can see there are some worms. There is a evil slug. But you will find butterflies. And you will find oh, cocoons, I should say. There's a wood bug. There's a wood bug. There's. So we've created a, a habitat in a very short amount of time that has all sorts of things growing in it. And there's a worm. You see, they're, they're going up there and they're, they're working on this right now. And this is a, a enriched carbon. So when sunlight shines on Earth, Earth is a living organism compared to Mars. That's not a living organism. So we live within a living organism. And the life works at taking carbon dioxide and turning it into basically enriched carbon, which is like leaves and natural products, coal, that sort of thing, limestone. So we live in a in an organism that's living and we're part of it, much like a biology in our bellies are part of uh, us, like as individuals, like we each are, are an individual and we each have a reliance on the harmony of the life within us. And it's a balance that's that's important to maintain. So very clay once you get down there. There's a lot of clay. But not too much. Not bad. There's some vermiculite. We got some vermiculite shipped to us in a shipping package from China and uh, tested for asbestos. Vermiculite is an excellent, excellent uh, additive to gardens. Um, shipping things around the world and packaging that can be put directly in the garden is smart. We should be doing more of that. Um, so it's a good time to talk to your beds and listen to your beds to see what they're telling you. But it's not a good time to use your broad fork. But it is the right time to order your broad fork. So if you've been thinking about getting a broad fork, start thinking about buying one right now. This video footage was recorded about a year ago uh, with the intention to be used this year to show the technique that I use and also to discuss the advantages and some safety warnings about using this tool. Notice the comfortable lifting handles to move the fork to the new position. Be very careful not to impale your foot 
The handles angled forward provides a much better position to stabilize yourself while inserting the tines into the soil. Another advantage of the forward angled handles is to allow the fork tines to come fully out of the ground, um, which you can do to the very top layer of soil. Get you up closer here. My technique plunges the fork in in intervals of about six to eight inches. And then you work it deep into the soil using your feet and then you partially break up that lower level then extract about halfway and then fluff the top layer in preparation for your seed bed. And repeat. When you're starting a new bed and breaking into the new soil, do so slowly. Once you get a, a little ways in, then you can break off new sections into the already loosened section are not actually suitable for pulling out one big rock. It's advisable to have a pry bar for doing that if you come into the event of, of large rocks. If you're forcing on only one time, you run the risk of breaking that one time. So there we have it. It is a very good workout. It is a way of building up your your beds to have a deeper active topsoil region and there's a lot of advantages over the intensive tilling method such as lowering water watering requirements um, increased carbon uh, sequestering because if you have a larger active topsoil area the tilling itself is, is less destructive. So that's the basic idea with the uh, broad fork and maybe I'll take you inside and do a little bit of whiteboard and uh, I'll share with you what somebody who was very knowledgeable about growing crops taught me about um, the seeds and the root development and the watering. Now I'm going to take some time to tell you why I think broad fork and moving to a less till or no till style of farming or gardening is better. First I'm going to start by talking about irrigation and watering and germination of seeds as it was taught to me um, by my boss. Um, one of the best jobs I had working on a farm and he was explaining to me how seeds grow and why you water and why you shouldn't water too much uh, but enough. You hear this quite often. Someone will say, you got to water your plants but not too much. So we'll start with them um, with earth. So we got the surface of earth um, which is slightly variable and curved and all the low spots of earth fill up with water because water naturally pools to the bottom. Um, and you have the hard round in my region we have the hard which is made out of um, or hard pan and that's the clay and could be sand down there. And this top section is called your active topsoil section and 
in your garden quite often you have um, sort of a line that goes like this and oftenly, often it's mechanically tilled so this is a sort of a layer of light fluffy and you work stuff into it. Quite often this is six inch and that might go down to you know 15 to 20 inch something like that so this down here is a clay and then coming up here quite often you'll have lots of rocks some bigger different particles some sand and other types of particles in there and when you work your land you can you can learn about your land and the history of the land there's little bits sometimes you'll see little arrow heads or fragments of, of tools that were used by um, people who have worked and lived on these lands for tens of thousands of years and you sort of recognize the history just from being involved with the soil layer. Now the most important thing for growing plants is is life. So in your topsoil area there's like little worms, there's bugs, and there is, you know, uh, fungus, bacterias, and it's, it's actually a living organism itself. Topsoil, you can think of it as a living organism made up of many, many other small and larger organisms that work together through associations and transactions. So the cycles of growing are dictated by astrological um, phenomena, such as the rotation of the whole earth as we come around to the bright side every single day. It's something you can rely on. And every month the moon goes around. And every year we go around so that the tilt of the earth Sometimes the northern hemisphere is pointing away from the sun and we're up here on the northern hemisphere and um, and sometimes the southern hemisphere is pointing towards the sun and as it rotates around and we get it's, it's very loopy so this is why it seems that everything we do is a bit loopy because that's dictated by the circumstances beyond our control which is dictated by these astrological phenomena, which you can learn about when you observe. So there's also nutrients in here, which is also a type of life. And this is dead and decaying, and quite often the worms and the insects will be working on that decay. So in the winter, you'll cover this with some mulch, compost, that sort of thing. And this all becomes part of your living organism. Now what you want to do as a gardener or a farmer is encourage beneficial plants, plants that benefit humans. And we figured out what these were tens of thousands of years ago and decided, yeah, beans are cool. So you save beans. It's completely unnatural um, for animals to be doing this. Um, most animals, the natural way of, of living is you don't go running around in the woods with a pocket full of beans, but we humans do, so that's an artificial process. So you save your seeds and in the spring, um, when the soil starts warming up and the tilt of the earth is facing the sun, the northern hemisphere, if you're in the northern hemisphere, and then you, you dig a little hole and you put your seed in there. And there's a water level 
and in winter it's quite hot. Um, where I live, my garden, quite often the water level goes right above. So I have raised beds, so this prevents this upper layer from being completely submerged in water. And this line is determined by the temperatures and other factors. So once you've got this surface sort of drying out, you can plant your seed in here. The sun comes out and things start warming up. And the seed needs another component. It needs the proper conditions for it to prosper, sprout and grow. So one is soil with nutrients and life in it. Another one is sunlight. And the other one is water. So when you first plant your seed, you want to have this damp. So the seed should be damp. And then once all these conditions are appropriate for the seed, the seed will crack out a little sprout. You don't need to water constantly. And it will grow out some hairs out of here. But this, this seed, mind you, is, is energy packed. It's like chock full of energy. It's um, all that energy. It, it's unbelievable. And it takes all that energy and it grows this sprout that comes up here and makes a couple leaves. This is called germination and it takes a little period of time. And, uh, and it, it happens usually really all of a sudden. You know, suddenly the ground starts breaking and boom, out comes a sprout and you've got this little sprout with two leaves. And what it's doing underground is it's chasing after this water level. So a tap root starts going down to drink the water and it draws the water and the dissolved nutrients and the dissolved minerals up through the roots up to the stem. But after it creates this sprout, there's no more energy left in the seed. None. Zero. Nilch. Nada. The seed energy is all gone to create the sprout. So where does the energy come from? Well, it comes from the sun. And the leaves absorb the CO2 from the atmosphere. And by the miracle of the cells, with an endothermic chemical reaction, it absorbs that sunlight and it enriches those carbons. And it rearranges them into more valuable um, molecules, complex molecules, through the miracle of light. And these are, are very valuable uh, molecules compared to CO2. CO2 is a low value molecule. And um, life will en enrich those molecules and turn them into carbohydrates, cellulose, proteins, sugars, oils and all sorts of other things that the plant uses to construct itself. And actually, at the very beginning, what it does is it constructs roots. So, often you'll see your sprout and you'll think, oh, I want to water it more. So you keep watering it, so this water level stays up here. And what happens is you get all these roots right at the top. But You've got to let the surface dry out, ideally, if the conditions are right. And this line will change over time. Every day the sun comes out and this little line of dampness will retreat. And when it retreats, this root chases after it. So you don't want to be too attentive on your watering after it sprouts. But seemingly, Quite often, for a week or two, it doesn't look like this plant's doing anything because all the action is underneath. And then over time, the water eventually gets down here. But what happened is, this root has now reached this line. 
whether you till with a spade every year or whether a mechanical tiller goes through here, you end up with this line. And below it, it's a more solid soil and the roots don't penetrate down that deep because of this, this strange little line that plants aren't, aren't used to. So this is where the broad fork comes in. And if in the spring you come in with your broad fork and and you break this up, you allow the roots to penetrate further down as it follows this receding line. Now, at some point in about two weeks, the plant starts growing and it, you get some other sprouts with more leaves and foliage, which is a very good thing. And you want this to happen before your hot season because this provides shade for your soil. So when the sun comes out, the water on the top of your bed evaporates off. To a few inches. So this is why it's so important to get those roots growing deep. So by breaking open this lower section it allows uh, more robust roots to come down here and draw from the steadier supply of water. Up here it is a more cyclical amount. If you got a rainy spell this will get wet. But if you get a good week or two or what's common around here is a good solid month without rain and, and warm temperatures in the summer. So to me this is this is why a broad fork is used. There's a few other things that, that I was taught and bear in mind I'm no scientist. I'm just passing on information as it was taught to me in the field. So that I could better understand and then you'd get uh, your beans growing in here. Look at that. I love beans. And if you do deep watering, this allows time for the plant to, to dry out. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but I was told that the root system will cycle Every, everything is in cycles in the world right you got your daily cycles and um, your your cycles of, of rain and dry your cycles of the month and everything's everything's completely loopy so in a dry period of time the roots will actually contract and dry out some creating microscopically thin layer of like the water level isn't constant, it just doesn't go down steady. It's constantly going up and down. So in the day when the sun comes out it recedes away from that heat and then at the night when things cool off the capillary action of, of the water due to the surface tension of the water it'll get drawn up through the particles and the roots actually expand and contract. When they fill up with water they get bigger and then when there's a dry spell the roots will get smaller and what that happens is you end up with a thin space around the roots so when it does rain or when you do water heavy what happens is the rain will get drawn down the roots to the very base but it's been engineered like this I mean it's been designed like this it's absolutely brilliant and the water, the capillary action, will get drawn down to the roots. There's a very important aspect of, of, of growing plants. So I don't know if that helps you or not. Um, that's kind of how it was taught to me. I'm, I'm no teacher, I'm no scientist. I'm just, um, no, I'm just, uh, just going through life. But you can trust me. I got patches on my elbows. I'm glad you've made it this far into the video. 
I'm proud of you for putting up with it. So, as to the accuracies of the science that I've just discussed about how to grow plants, it's up to you to determine whether it helps you or not. I'd love to make you a broad fork if you're here in the Comox Valley or somewhere on Vancouver Island or elsewhere in BC. And if you're elsewhere and would like to have a broad fork made for yourself or make your own broad fork, that's fine. Here's some drawings that I made that uh, could help you along your way. The inventor of this style of broad fork was John Jeevens in uh, Stanford University back in the 80s, and it's an excellent tool. So uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more of the manufacturing process, uh, my thinking process, um, contract business, or drafting, or acquisitions, or purchasing, or uh, vending, and would like to learn a little bit more about this sort of stuff, like or subscribe. Alright, thanks for watching everybody. Goodbye.